This is Jim Cannell on Today Television, Bible study for the 21st century. So welcome friends, always a joy to come your way. I hope you enjoy it too. Uh, some of you are telling me you wish the program was an hour long, but hey, I don't, I, I don't know if you want that. <laughs> I'm not sure I want that either. Nevertheless, great to come your way. We're going through the gospel slowly, slowly. Uh, right now we're in the gospel of Luke and we're right in the middle of what's called the Sermon on the Plain. Not the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Plain. And we'll get to that right after this. and to take care of the widow and the orphan in their time of need. And that is exactly what we do. Lives are changing. Why? Because Jesus is Lord. And why? Because Christians have come together as a body. The united body of Christ is coming and saying, it stops with this generation. We break it and we move on. The kind of religion that God endorses is to care for orphans and widows in their distress, justice, and to keep oneself unpolluted from the world, righteousness. So, the Sermon on the Plain. I set it up for you last program. Just to remind you, you've got two plains on the northeast corner of the Sea of Galilee and the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee. And I think, I'm pretty sure that what we're talking about here is the one on the northwest corner, which is larger than the one on the northeast corner. It's more accessible too, because it's right between Capernaum and Tiberias and Magdala. Um, so it, it's probably the place. And it was a flat plain in those days. Today, as I described last week, as I've driven by it hundreds of times over the years, um, it's a banana and citrus grove. But Jesus has been up in a mountain overnight. He comes down. He chooses his 12 disciples. We looked at that last week. Um, and there's this massive crowd of people uh, surrounding him. So let's pick it up here on verse 19 of Luke, of Luke 6. The whole multitude sought to touch him for power went out from him and healed them. He lifted up his eyes toward his disciples and said, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you, revile you, cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For indeed your reward is great in heaven, for in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the prophets. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you, pray for those who despitefully use you. And he goes on, and I'll, I'll, I'll follow him in a few minutes, but I just need to get back to this. First of all, Luke says he healed them all. As far as I know, that's the only time in the four Gospels where that kind of a statement is made. 
I mean, we're talking a huge crowd here. He tells us, you know, they came from Judea, all Judea. They came from Jerusalem. I mean, that's a major area. And coming down from Jerusalem to Gennesaret is just as arduous as it is to come down from Tyre and Sidon, where they also come from. So they're way up there, way beyond the Upper Galilee, way up in the mountains, the Shuf Mountains, as they're called, uh, where a lot of the uh, warfare has occurred over the years. I've been up, up there myself with my trusty machine gun that the Israelis insisted I carry with me when I was in that area. Uh, but that's a very high area. And then Jerusalem was very high. And so to get down to Gennesaret on the northwest uh, coast of uh, Gal uh, Sea of Galilee, you got to come probably a two-day walk at least down, 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 down. And then from Jerusalem, you have to come down to Jericho and then along the Jordan Valley. It's a very long journey. Some would have come through Samaria, which is very hilly and I think even more arduous than going down to the Jordan Valley. You got heat, you got um, desert conditions. Um, it, it, the fact that they were there is amazing. And this may be one reason why Jesus was so open and willing to heal them all. I mean, they've, they've paid a price to be there. And even though he may have been concerned that they were there just for what they'd get out of him and not what he was able to put into them, nevertheless, he healed them, okay? So he then lifts up his eyes to his disciples. That doesn't mean he's going like this. It means he's just, okay, he's, he's dealing with the people. Now it's just Luke's way of saying now he focused on the disciples, all right? So you can be sure there were hundreds listening in, but this was for the disciples, just like the Sermon on the Mount was for the disciples. He starts with four beatitudes, followed by four counterpoint woes. And uh, the, the, the contrast between the, the, the beatitude and the woe is quite stark. Um, the contrast between the poor and the rich, between the hungry and the full, between the sad and the happy, between the um, vilified and the celebrated, okay? I mean, it's very, very much polarities that he uses as a teaching tool here. And he presents them in the context of that day in verse 23. Where's 23? Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Um, he's referring to the day of the Lord, a future event where Messiah is revealed and the justice of God, uh, reward and punishment um, uh, is satisfied. Uh, on that day, uh, poverty, hunger, sorrow, alienation will be forever banished. Um, even as the rich, uh, the happy, uh, the full, the socially valued are exposed as empty vessels. Wow. He says the rich are going to mourn and weep, even as the afflicted rejoice. Now, there may have been a few rich people in the crowd. I wouldn't doubt that there were. Oftentimes, Jesus was healing those who were very well fixed and well situated in terms of status and power. He even healed some of the upper echelon of the Roman uh, occupiers from time to time. Um, they might have found Jesus' words a touch harsh about the rich. You know, what's wrong with being rich? You know, we, we could say that, you know, in our culture. I mean, uh, wealth is. Uh, is the goal, right, in our materialistic world. Uh, the richer you are, the more respect you have. Uh, we've got the world's richest men, and it's always a battle between uh, the founder of Amazon and the founder of Tesla uh, uh, cars. Um, why, why, why is it bad to be full, you know? It, it, isn't happiness everyone's goal? And certainly good social standing is a value. All true, but I think there may be as many as 2,000 references to money in the Bible. Some of those give grim warnings about riches. Uh, one of the sternest passages in the subject comes from Jesus, half-brother James in the book of James, chapter 5. And let me read it to you. Chapter 5, verses 1 to 6 of James. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that's coming on you. Your wealth is rotted. Moths have eaten your clothes. 
Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in these last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. Again and again, the Bible writers attribute the accumulation of wealth to the exploitation of the poor. Their bent backs bear testimony to injustice. And, and, and you know, I'm not interested in presenting a diatribe here or laying any guilt on any of us, okay? Because all of us share in this to a greater or lesser degree. But if it weren't for people working at minimum wage or less, we might not have branded t-shirts and uh, runners and uh, various fashion items, um, material for building, diamonds, coffee, cocoa, batteries for our cell phones. What? Batteries for us? One of a, the key ingredients in, in, in your battery, in your cell phone, is cobalt. Where does cobalt come from? In the main, it comes from the Democratic, the Democratic Republic of Congo, in the main, mined by child labor. I've uh, been in Bangladesh as the shifts end, the 12-hour shifts end at the uh, uh, horrible-looking sweatshops where thousands of young, impoverished women come out and get on to flat top trailers that are pulled by a tractor to their villages. And they've worked 12 hours for maybe a buck and a half, two dollars for the day. And we're gonna wear the sweatshirts they've made branded with high fashion sporting names that we pay 30 times more for than what it costs to produce. Okay, so we're all in on this, okay? The biblical view is that wealth essentially is built on the bent backs of the poor. In our day, we credit material success to vision and work ethic. You know, we, we laud those who are wealthy because they obviously have vision and they work hard. But even as we do so, as I say, thousands of the poorest of the poor, mainly women, are working those 12-hour shifts in the sweatshops of Bangladesh and other parts of the world where states are failed so that us wealthy Westerners can wear the latest ready-made fashions, paying the uber-rich sportswear companies 20 to 30 times the manufacturing cost. Historically, wealth has always had a bad smell. And the only way to mitigate the odor is to seek and provide justice for the poor. And I'll pick up on this, and I'm not wanting anyone to feel bad, but this is a sober word from Jesus. Why dance when you have very little? When you live from day to day with food insecurity, rampant disease, sickness, and death? You dance because your heart is full of love for God and your hope is strong. WOW has come alongside as the hands and feet of the Lord, providing both home-based care and assurance of God's love. You're happy and you've got to dance. Please support WOW. Let's keep them dancing. So as I was saying earlier, you know, in the biblical view, wealth has a bad smell. Uh, 
It does make the point, however, that it's not money that is the issue. It's the love of money that's the issue. Coveting. I know a lot of poor people, or I've met a lot of poor people who love money and will sell their grandmother for it. They're just as guilty as the guy who says, all I need, even though I've got multiple millions, is another dollar more. In both cases, guilty of the love of money. It's not the money itself, it's the love of it. It's a spiritual condition. So let's, let's keep that straight. But Jesus took this discussion one step further. The Apostle Paul tells the Corinthian Christians about, quote, the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And we're not talking about material richness here. We're talking about the only richness that matters, and that's spiritual richness. Rich reward in heaven is Jesus' gift to the faithful. And then there's this warning to the church in Laodicea in Revelation. You say, I am rich. I have become wealthy have need of nothing, and yet, this is Jesus talking, you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Woe indeed. You know, the Bible makes it clear that naked we came into the world, naked we return. We can't take anything with us. In fact, and I'm not being trite here. The only thing we can take with us is what we've given away. Let's keep that in mind. Okay, let's shift gears here. Verse 29. You might call this the uh, new wineskin laws of love and mercy, you might. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, what, offer the other also, really, Jesus? Give to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them. Jesus is transitioning here to two of the key elements in the ethics of the kingdom of heaven. And this is still in the Sermon on the Plain. The first is love. Clearly he's not referring to, you know, unsustainable, romantic infatuation. Emotions come, emotions go, we all know that. Rather he's underscoring the volitional commitment that's at the root of all true, enduring love. And he's emphasizing the point. And to do this, he calls his listeners to love their enemies. Now, it, this is an impossible command. At least it appears to be. How do you love your enemies when you have such feelings against them? Keep this in mind, friends. Love is not ultimately an emotion. Love is a decision. Like is an emotion. If Jesus had called on us to like our enemies, that was the impossibility. But to love our enemies is possible because to love someone means to seek their highest good. You can love someone or do the loving thing for someone you don't like. We've all done that. Some of us have done it today. Someone you don't like, but you've done the loving thing for them for their good, not for yours. But you've done it because it's the right thing to do. This kind of loving is unconditional, it's forgiving, and it's kind. And as such, it reflects the very nature of the Father. Let's look at 35. Love your enemies, do good, and lend hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you'll be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the unthankful and the evil. He's unthankful. I should say he's, he's kind to the unthankful and the evil. Um, how do we do that? Well, Jesus says you do it by blessing those who hate you, who curse you, and who mistreat you in verses 27 and 28. 
a tall order, followed by something taller still. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Some of you, I'm sure, have had the experience just recently of losing something in terms of a relational uh, love that you thought you'd have forever, and it's gone. I won't get into what might have happened, but you're still suffering and grieving the loss of something you thought would last forever. You know, this is true of civilization. This is true of Lebanon. Years ago, Lebanon was known as the Switzerland of the Middle East. What a beautiful country. It still is a beautiful country. I've been there. I, you know, and Beirut was called the Paris of, Le of, of the Middle East. It, what a beautiful place. And within just a matter of a few years, it went from total beauty to total disrepair and failure. It's amazing how fragile civilization can be. Yemen is another case in point. There was a time when Yemen was so beautiful, situated there in a kind of a mountain, mountainous area, but with wonderful people and, and having a great life with literally centuries and centuries and centuries of history. And now it's not only a failed state, but it's probably the most disaster prone area in all of the world right now. Civilization can come and go. Relational strengths can come and go. And sometimes when we're on the losing end, when we feel that loss, we not only feel a loss, we can feel anger and sometimes bitterness. Wanting to lash out at the injustice of it all and certainly holding accountable those who have injured us, those who have wounded us. I think what Jesus is saying is there may come a day when you will be the wounder and there will be someone else who will be the wounded. You can't imagine it now any more than you could have imagined the disaster that befell you just recently. The fact is that human nature is very volatile. Human nature operates on a very thin margin in terms of success and failure. And because we are human, we walk that fine line all of the time. If you don't believe me, just remember the last time you got cut off in traffic. What was your reaction? If you'd had a gun, maybe you'd want to pull the trigger. Hopefully not. But road rage is symptomatic of that which lies just beneath the surface in human nature, even for those of us who've committed our lives to the Lord. So in order to mitigate that possibility, indeed to neutralize it. We need to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. Do unto others, even those who have shown us injury. The day may come when we'll be injured and we might look to them for healing. It might happen. They, they call this the golden rule. You know, it's not exclusive to the Christian faith. It's been out there for centuries. It predated biblical times. But Jesus took something that obviously has its origin in the heart of God, in the image of God, which has created all mankind in all of history, way back, even during the Sumerian, Mesopotamian, you know, early Chinese, early Egyptian um, eras. People long before Christ were still made in the image of God. This is an appeal to that very image of God which is in us. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You know, mercy is gut level love. Essentially in doing unto others as you would have them do unto you is, is showing mercy. Um, we are to actively show forgiveness, generosity to those who physically abuse us, uh, steal from us. And, you know, I'm not thinking, saying for a minute that Jesus is saying we should turn a blind eye to sexual assault or wife and child beating. No, not, not for a minute. Call the police right away. What he's talking about here is the cut and thrust of human dynamics when people are pushing ahead, oblivious to the harm they may be doing to others. Injury, injustice are the inevitable collateral damage of selfish behavior. Jesus says we should take it in stride and be merciful. 
It's too easy to push back. Adding fuel to the fire is counterproductive. The golden rule is always, always the best strategy for conflict resolution. And the children of the Most High, as he says in 35b, know this and extend grace in 35d even to the ungrateful and the wicked. This is a tough one, and I've already referred to the toughness of it, but let me say this. There is a remarkable freedom, a remarkable freedom that comes from forgiving someone. Because when you forgive them, the weight of the injury, the weight of the injustice is suddenly released. No, you don't forget, but you're no longer holding them accountable. You're no longer bearing the grudge. You're no longer stewing with the bitterness that embitters your own soul. Think about it. WOW works with local churches in needy countries. We mobilize those churches, pastors, and volunteers in a concerted effort to care for orphans and widows in their homes and villages. Through that strong faith-based platform, we're able to not only provide food, medicine, and crisis intervention, but we're also able to lead these afflicted ones to faith in God. It's powerful, humbling, and well worth the effort. Please support WOW with your generous gifts and faithful prayer. Thank you. I've had a lot of people ask me how things are going with our Working for Orphans and Widows ministry overseas with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. It's amazing how the Lord has been protecting these very vulnerable orphans and widows whose compromised immune systems because of HIV and AIDS are, are so vulnerable to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic with its now emerging variants. Life goes on, people still have to survive and, and these people with whom we deal are survivors. And by God's grace, you know, with home-based care, we are able through our huge army of church-based volunteers in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southern India, we're able to really make a difference in their lives and care for them even as they're dying and see them come to faith before they die. When you support WOW, when you support JCT, that's the bottom line. I wanna thank you for helping us in this great, great mission.